Thank you for coming to uh, this presentation. So uh, just to quickly introduce myself, my name's Owen, Owen Pape. So uh, I work, I've been working for CGG for about 12 years now. So I'm a technical guy, I'm not in uh, recruitment, not HR. Um, I've thrown up my kind of career progression at CGG, so it's pretty linear. You know, started as a geophysicist in 2006, and I worked my way up to supervisor, so I manage quite a few teams now. Um, my specialism um, is building models of the Earth, so I use different types of data for that. So I use well data, you know, borehole data, where, uh, where a lot of different kind of physical measurements are made. Um, I also perform inversions and also a technique called full waveform inversion, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, I've worked on data from all around the world, so obviously CGG is a geoscience company, so it's all about applying hard science, the hard sciences to the Earth. So that's geology, physics, maths, you name it. Um, and that, in, in our particular, in, our, in this region, we call, we call it EMI, Europe, Africa, and Middle East. So I've worked on data from all over EMI. And in terms of the size of those data sets, I've been from what we call a postage stamp of 400 square kilometers to 35,000 square kilometers. Our core business is in the oil and gas industry, exploration. So um, everything in that industry is in dollars, US dollars. Uh, and you can see the kind of value of the projects I've worked on and the kind of time frames. So, as far as I'm aware, in the last 12, 24 years, uh, 12 years, I've worked on at least 24 projects uh, that I can remember. And they've, they've ranged in value from $300,000 to uh, 12 million. Um, the, the, the value of the project is not kind of proportional to the size of it. So quite often, quite a small project, because that will be very focused on the client's particular needs, could be very, very high value. Whereas an exploration project looking at a large area can actually be a bit cheaper. Um, <clears throat> obviously, as I say, core business is oil and gas. I've actually got quite a good track record in this, in this, uh, in this department. Obviously, my clients are the ones who drill the actual wells, but the data I worked on and delivered for them, uh, three major oil discoveries were made. Um, and I say major ones, I mean ones that actually went on to be developed, because discovering oil is actually quite easy. There's a lot of it around, despite what people say, but developing it, getting out of the ground is quite difficult. And finally, just to kind of emphasize that once you're in industry, it's not all work. There is also an element of research and, you know, this connection to kind of academia. I've actually been lucky enough to be the present, uh, present uh, my own, and author my own paper and present it at an industry conference. And I've been a co-author on a further five papers. <coughs> and I've thrown in a few images here. Um, I did geophysics at the University of Edinburgh. An image from a recent project, which was imaging um, <coughs> a, a, very, a buried reef that was sitting on top of a volcanic dome. <coughs> Have any of you kind of familiar with Edinburgh and Arthur Seat? There's a big, the cat, the big, um, or the big, or the Edinburgh Castle that sits on a big volcanic dome. Similar situation, except this one's been buried under kilometres and kilometres of rock. Um, my wife and daughter at the beach, um, just so you know, I'm human. Uh, and um, and then another image just showing some glacial channelling uh, in the North Sea, which again I'll kind of touch on later. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of CGG. So this should be just a few slides, and then I'll talk about what what a physicist would do at CGG. Uh, and I've put geophysicists in brackets, um, because that's all we are. There's nothing, when people hear the term geophysics, they think, ooh, what's that? Physics, it's just physics, hard applied physics. Just up to, you know. um, and then the last thing I'll touch on, and probably as part of the Q&A, rather than presenting, will be the application process and benefits. So in terms of CGG, you've probably never heard of us, um, but we're a French company. We've been around for a long time. Um, I say 87 years, it should be 88, we're now in 2019. Um, and we were probably what the pioneers for uh, applying physics to things like oil exploration. Um, we've got about these other numbers, the 950,000, that kind of effectively refers to the fact that we actually ha own a, a, a huge amount of geophysical data across the world. Um, it's probably a almost a million square now, actually. Um, and that takes very different, many different forms, from seismic data, again, which I'll talk about later, to magnetic and gravity data. Um, we have about 5,000 plus employees, so we're not we're not a small company, but we're not, we're also we're not a gargantuan company. We're quite a nice, quite a good size. You're not, you're not, an, you're, we're big enough that there's lots of opportunities to progress and travel, but not so big that you're just a number. In terms of the other numbers, five and a half million, that just basically means that we've cornered the market in terms of equipment. We provide, a, a third of our business is actually in equipment, manufacture and design. So that, that's not just geophysical equipment, that's also equipment for engineering uh, purposes as well. In terms of compute, we're actually among the world's top ten for computing capacity. Obviously, that's published computer capacity. We don't know what the Pentagon's doing or the Chinese military, who does. But we actually have a huge amount of processing power, uh, GPUs, CPUs, and we get it through petabytes of data on a daily basis. Um, in, terms of, in terms of R&D, in terms of a proportion of the company, we actually have a, quite a high proportion of people dedicated to R&D. 
But I emphasize that, emphasize that they're dedicated to R&D, but opportunities exist to, um, to actually work on research projects and development projects as just a, a, a normal kind of employee. Um, we also have a satellite arm, and that's, we've got about 40 foot, again, we're quite experienced in that area, we've had about 45 years of remote sensing experience, and I'll touch on that later. Um, and then in terms of where we are, as I say, we're a French company, um, but we're also a global company. So this is, our, this is, this is the sp spread of our offices across the, across the world. So the size of the circles is proportional to how many people are there. Um, the color of them tells you what kind of office it is. So uh, blue it, what, is what we call an open center. It takes work from all over the world, from all sorts of all different clients. Uh, orange is a dedicated center. It's where people have been uh, uh, in-house. They've been set, you know, they, we, sent, we sent some people to sit in-house for client. So for instance, Madrid is with Repsol. Uh, London is with, is with CNOC. Um, so on and so forth. And then the green one is Armati. That's quite an unusual one. That's a joint venture between uh, the Kansas Stanley State Oil Company and CDG. So it's a little bit different. Um, and that's all I've got to say about it. So obviously, as I say, our core business, our core money earner at the moment is, in oil, is oil and gas. And oil and, oil and gas, the sector, is, di is di uh, divided into kind of three components. So you have upstream, midstream, and downstream. So downstream is your petrol stations, you know, your kind of uh, retail. Midstream is your logistics, you know, you're getting the oil from where you've pumped it out to those petrol stations. And upstream is where we are. So upstream is all about ex initial exploration. It's about once you've found it, is it worth, it, uh, is it worth drilling? Is it worth exploiting? Uh, and then it's about production. So it's, once you've drilled into it, uh, you've got to monitor that reservoir because, uh, of oil because if you don't, you can have things like what happened to Macondo, BP Macondo disaster. So there's our business... Uh, model covers all of these different uh, aspects of the upstream uh, oil and gas sector. So I mean, just to give you a quick overview of the business, so we have quite a few different components, but the, the ones I want to talk about today uh, are the ones where we recruit physicists uh, in the imaging, consulting, and to a lesser extent, the multiple and new ventures uh, areas. I actually, I'm from the imaging arm, so I'm an imaging geophysicist, um, but I will also talk about the consulting arm. So what does a physicist do at CGG? So this is an example of size, what we call seismic field data. So this is data. So I'm showing you three type, three uh, kind of types of acquisition. So on land we have what we call vibro-sized trucks, which emit a, a seismic source, a, sound, a, a series of sound waves into the earth. Uh, at sea we'll have we'll, we could either, we'll either have tow cables near the surface uh, with many many receivers on, um, or we'll have receivers at the seabed, uh, actually embedded at the seabed, uh, recording uh, vibrations. The actual data itself looks like this doesn't look like much uh, to the untrained eye. But effectively what you're looking at here is marine data, and what you're seeing is you're seeing, you're seeing um, amplitude and travel time information for all the sound waves that we've put into the Earth uh, coming back up. So each of these things is a shot record, what we call a shot record, uh, and obviously this is travel time, this is the time it's taken for the signal to return to the surface, uh, and along the top is the receiver location. Um, so you're seeing uh, on the very, very near, near, near um, receiver very, very near the source, you're seeing obviously the lowest travel time. And this, this, this event here is actually the seabed in this case. Um, but you obviously you don't just record reflections, you record all sorts of uh, waves, refractions, uh, all sorts of very unusual waves li li linked to subsurface geometry, like what we call prism waves, stuff I can, I could talk to you about these all day long. I won't because I've only got 30 minutes. Um, but all I, what I will emphasize is, is that it's, it's all about waves. And, and obviously that's a very, very important component of physics. So this, this is our field, what we call our field data, this is what we record, and this is what we produce with that data. So this is an image uh, somewhere in the world, um, and what, we've got, what I'm showing you is, the fire, is, as, as all of that data has been converted to this image of, of the geology beneath our feet, um, and it, I've overlaid it here with, uh, with the velocity model, because of course we record travel time data. So we record how fast the, way, the time it takes for the waves to travel through the Earth, so in order to image those waves to, to a location actually emitted, they're reflected from, you have to devise a very, very accurate velocity model. Um, so anyone hazard a guess as to where this is in the world? I'll give you a clue. It's not far from here. <laughs> no, not bad. It's the central North Sea. This is the North Sea, yeah? So... Um, this is, this is where most of the, the UK's oil and gas reserves are. So I want to give you a quick overview of what you can see, see here. So 
The North Sea's got a really, really complex geological history. Uh, actually, one of the most difficult places in the world to find oil. Um, so it's got a number of components. So this, this is a map of that. Uh, <coughs> this, is a, this is what we call a depth slice um, through that image I just showed you. Um, and you can see this is about 35,000 square kilometers you're looking at. Uh, and you can see uh, a series of what like river, river channels. And that's exactly what they are. They're river channels um, <coughs> that formed after the last ice age. Uh, where all the you know where all the ice was melting rapidly, and they all and they traverse the North Sea all, uh, everywhere. And um, in terms of a modern day kind of analog, this is an image from Canada, um, when you can see the similarities. So again, to put that into some context, I've just moved that image up and up to the right there, and you can and just showing you where this traverse line is. Um, so again, you can kind of see the scale of the image we've produced here. But then talk about some of the other parts of this. So. Again, I'm not expecting you to know much about the geological history of the North Sea, but this upper, effectively the color, the color, color scale I've used here for the velocities is, is a very, very good analog for that geological history. So this upper part, as I say, the very, very near surface is where all that glacial channeling took place. And then we get into actually, uh, we see uh, what we call contourites, which, which actually the modern day analog for that as well would be uh, megadunes. From, and this, in this case, this is a satellite image from Botswana showing lots and lots of megadunes, and they occur at this level. And all of these sediments were deposited very, very rapidly um, after, <coughs> not only after the last ice age, but actually after, like, <coughs> after the, at the beginning of the tertiary, tertiary uh, epoch, which comes after you know, dinosaurs and everything else. <coughs> if I kind of move down the section, any of you are familiar with the White Cliffs of Dover, which I hope you all are, um, that actually correlates to this very, very red, bright section that cuts across this area. Um, chalk, which is what it is, is a very, very interesting substance. And this is, again, this kind of links to geophysics. When you think of, when, when we're looking at chalk, we're looking at material, a medium, and we're analyzing those properties as physicists, trying to understand why, for instance, you know, our, our seismic waves, our sound waves travel through them the way they do. And chalk has got a, very, a lot of very unusual uh, properties, particularly when you put it under pressure. Uh, and in this case, um, chalk is one of the reasons why we have an oil and gas sector in the UK, because when you put it under pressure, um, not only does it, it actually res it becomes what we call overpressured. So it, it, gets, it, reaches to a, it reaches a point where you can no longer put any more, it doesn't respond to any more pressure put on it. And that acts as a seal. It becomes completely impermeable to any fluids traveling through it, which means that any oil and gas beneath it cannot travel, tra tra is trapped there and cannot leak to the surface. So then the other thing you need in any kind of what we call a petroleum system is you need a source rock. This is an image from Dorset. Uh, on near the beach. So this is the Kimmeridge clay, as we call it. And if you go there, um, locals used to report when there was lightning storms, fires erupting on, on the face of this beach. And the reason for that is because oil is literally leaking out of that. If you go there, you can actually see oil leaking out of the rock. And that's the source rock for the oil that we have, that we put in our, put in our engines. And it sits, it sits around about here, just beneath this, this chalk, impermeable chalk layer. And that has some, again, that has some very unusual properties because it tends to be very, very slow in nature. But also, because of the way um, the, it layers, it has very, very, very high anisotropic properties. I don't know if any of you are familiar with anisotropy in crystals. Sometimes light takes longer, light can take longer to travel through a crystal in one direction than another. Um, in this case, because of the layering, um, the, it's, the sound waves traveling through the layer travel faster along the layers and they do through them. And then the final kind of interesting feature you'll see on this particular section is this object here. So I'm not going to ask you what, what it is. Uh, if you were a room of geologists, I would see, I would ask. But um, what this is is actually what we call a salt, salt dome. So I guess I've put an image of kind of the Dead Sea and a, a salt lamp. I don't know if you've seen these salt lamps for sale in, in kind of touristy shops. That's what it is. It's salt. So Long, long, long time ago, the UK used to be a very, a bit like the Dead Sea, Red Sea situation, where very, very shallow, very, very high temperatures, lots of salt layers laid down. And when you take salt, and that, you take that rock salt and you put it underground, uh, it actually moves like treacle over time. It actually moves as fast as treacle. Um, and, what, and what it does is it, it pushes its way through all the, rock, all, the, all the rock layers and looks for points of weakness. And when it finds one, it, it pushes through, which is exactly what we're seeing here. And again, salt is a, a really, really key, a really important thing for oil and gas uh, discovery because what happens is oil and gas, because the salt's punched a hole through this, this chalk layer, oil and gas tends to follow it. But salt's quite interesting because it's like a liquid. 
It's effectively, it creates all sorts of weird and wonderful shapes, uh, which means that it's really good at trapping that oil and gas beneath it. So again, salt imaging and, and exploring these salt bodies is really, really uh, significant. Uh, it's really, 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 really important in terms of uh, finding oil, but also a really, really significant challenge. Um, salt's got one other unusual property um, in that it's, it's very, very fast in terms of sound waves traveling through it, but it's effectively opaque to them. And also, it, in terms of gravity, in terms of a gravity signature, it has a really, really strong gravity signature because it's very, very lo low density um, compared to normal, normal rock. So if you, this salt dome, for instance, you can actually pick it up with a gravity survey, it would, it would, it would ping out against all the surrounding rock. So that's, that's a very interesting um, feature. And that's just, again, touching the kind of work we do. There's a lot of variety in the kind of data we use uh, and the way we analyze it. So how do, we start, how do we achieve these kind of images that I just showed you? Um, so I've got an example here. I guess I don't know how many of you, a lot of you will be probably have touched on or learned about the kind of principles of inversions. Uh, inversions, they're, it's, they're mathematical tools. Um, they're ways of taking data, updating a model, uh, uh, starting model of data, and getting a result. They're good. They're very, very powerful tools. Have they one significant disadvantage in that they quite often rely on quite heavy preconditioning and are quite good, and usually quite a good starting model. So by the time you're finished, your starting model uh, is the biggest determinant of the result you're going to get. Um, so where we, where, we are, where we kind of differentiate ourselves and where we are bring, again, bring physics into the equation is we use a technique known as full-wave form inversion, which I'll show you next. And what this does is it, it brings it, it actually operates from a fundamental, it's still an inversion, but it uses fundamentally, fundamental physics, uh, physical principles. So in this case, what we do is we, we have our starting model and we have our field data, and we know the location of all our receivers and our sources when we you know, require that field data. And we form a model um, with synthetic, with a, with a, because we know what our source wave was that we put into the Earth, we take that source sign signature, that signal, and we form a model through our starting model with that, and then we compare it to our field data, um, because obviously we, we know the location of our source and receiver, so we can record this synthetic wave field, um, and then we, that's when the inversion mathematical part comes back in, and we're comparing you know, the, 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 two, the two data sets to and effectively update our starting model so that one, so when we use the wave equation to form a model repeatedly, iteratively, uh, one matches the other. And when you do that, you achieve this. So if I just toggle between the two uh, images, this is our starting model. This is actually a very, very good result, a very good image of the geology. Um, and that's the model on the right, the velocity model that we've used to do, produce, produce this image. And this is our full waveform version model. And you can see that the, just to the layman's eye, that a lot of these kind of uh, signals are a lot stronger, better focused. But also, when you look at the, the model, the actual velocity model itself, it actually looks a bit like the layering of the geology. If you were to look at that as a cartoon, that right-hand model, and say, oh, these are different layers, this is chalk, this is a layer of coal, or whatever, you could interpret that. You could even see where there's been faulting, where there's been cracks, fracturing. Um, obviously, you can see that on the seismic. And you can also see it on the model. So it's a very, very powerful tool that operates off physical, as I say, fundamentally, it's a physical tool rather than a mathematical tool. Another example of, of, of the same tool, and again, I'm trying to give you a flavor of the kind of work we're doing, uh, which is really, really kind of high-end physics and employs a lot of powerful computing. Um, this, the, the, the Earth's, the, the subsurface has lots and lots of very unusual features. And one of them is uh, gas. <clears throat> Quite often, there's got pockets of gas, and you could, they're not all. Sometimes they're natural gas, sometimes like sulfur dioxide, you know, sometimes a car, you know, monoxide. You know, sometimes they're absolutely deadly. You drilled into it, you kill everyone on the rig. <clears throat> so you have to a, you have to know where these gas pockets are, but b, they also have effects on the actual image you're, you're trying to image. So in this case, we know we, there's a known gas field. This is um, in this particular area that I'm showing you, near the surface, and if you kind of Look at the image. You can see, and it'll become more apparent when I show you after the, or how we, when we resolve this problem. You can see that beneath this body, the image kind of becomes fainter and kind of all the. When you see these lines, the the, the geological layers are kind of dipping like this, but they become a bit distorted and kind of diffuse beneath the beneath the body. Again, using for, what we're seeing there is effectively we're seeing effective wave dispersion as uh, the gas is absorbing um, the higher frequencies. And so we're just left in lows. And if you, so if, if, but we can resolve that again using things like full waveform inversion, which again rely on uh, physical modeling. Um, and we, what we do is we, we can create a model, we can update a model um, of, the, of this gas pocket. 
and improve our image. So if I show you the next slide, so the model's on the top, so the model's showing the velocity and the, the kind of what we call Q, which is, a, which is effectively the effect of friction and, and absorption um, on your wave. And, you, and on the left, you can see the effect of the structure. So if I just toggle a few times, you can, you can see how that very, a dim zone that's kind of distorted and warped becomes, sort of has a similar amplitude, becomes much more continuous with the structures on either side. So this, this feature is purely an anomaly linked to what's in the, above it, um, which is important for two reasons. One is that this is the true position of these events. And two, two sorry, and two, sometimes these kind of, these dim outs are actually real. So sometimes these dim outs are real and not related to things in the shallow. Sometimes they're related to the gas leaking, hydrocarbons leaking from below. And actually, you can get quite excited thinking, right, I found a source of hydrocarbons. So it's important to know the difference. So uh, I've hope, hopefully I've given you an indication, uh, an indication of kind of what a geophysicist or what physicists would do at CGG. And now I'm going to talk about our remote sensing side. So both our geophysicist positions and our remote sensing positions, which are both graduate positions, require no prior experience. Um, of, of either. All, all, what we're looking for is we're looking for people who, who, are, who combine the technical kind of agility, you know, they can process new information quickly, uh, who are interested, who are passionate about physics, who are interested in what they do and what they've learned at university. And we're looking for people who are good, good problem solvers, who look at a problem and go, right, okay, how do I solve this? Um, so I'll show you some remote sensing uh, stuff. So obviously I'm just throwing out some pretty satellite images for you at the moment. Um, the emphasis here is that we, our remote sensing guys, although on the imaging side we tend to mainly focus on oil and gas, the satellite guys, they tend to look at a whole range of different environments. Um, and they've been in the business, as I say, for 45 years, very, very well respected um, and very, very active. But I'm going to now give you a bit of a flavour of the kind of projects they do. Um, so this is a map of the, of the UK. Um, and you're probably wondering what this is. So this is what we call, this is, our motion, this is actually a motion map. So this, this is a map that actually we, that we as a company have been creating since 2008. And we're literally we're monitoring the surface of the UK within millimeter scale um, since 2008. So we have this, you know, using the available satellite data, we have this ability, we're, we're able to, you know, we, ha we, have, we provide this service to all the foot businesses all over the UK with all sorts of different needs. And they can see how the Earth's changing within millimeters, not just today, but over the last 10 years. So that's, again, that's, that's one aspect of what we do. This is somewhere, uh, I think it's near Sumatra. Uh, this is, what again, using satellite data to, um, to kind of map the shallow water, uh, bathymetric mapping. So that's really important because in some parts of the world, there's very strong currents, uh, uh, sediments can move around quickly, so it's important for vessels that are navigating those areas to know what's happening, particularly when they're very, very shallow. This image is, um, is, sh is showing you, is what, it's from an INSAR surface deformation image. Um, so what this is actually showing you is uh, a likely sinkhole. So what we're looking at here is someone, in this case, particular case, it was a housing project, and they wanted to build houses as an area. And they wanted to, so we, we did an assessment uh, and show that actually it was at risk of developing sinkholes. You know, classic, and we've all read about them. There seems to be a lot of sinkholes in the news in, recently, and, and this is a classic example. Um, so that's, a geo, that's what we would call the geohazard. Well, there's other, so the geohazard detection is one big element of what we do, but also uh, geohazard monitoring is another. So I don't know if you, any of you remember, about, it was about 10 years ago, 2006, there was a mud volcano erupted in Indonesia. Um, that's, that's a satellite image of it. Uh, and you can see the mud, mud volcanoes, they, the mud they produce is incredibly toxic and it sets like cement and it just destroys, it's very, very hot as well. So it's, it's basically toxic. And, it just, and once, you know, and you, so it was a major environmental disaster for the area. Um, so you, we were actually employed to monitor it, to make rapid assessments as to where the flow was going, uh, where people, you know, and also kind of the lifespan of the, project, of the volcano, what, they, who, no one knew how long it was going to last. And there's obviously, you can, on the surface, you can look at obviously where the flow is going. You can monitor its spread, like with this image. But you can, again, you can also look at it in terms of surface deformation. So in this case, what you're seeing here, so this is, this is a map image taken, an image taken at the same time as that satellite image. And you can actually see how the Earth is swelling beneath that area. Um, and that's been an ongoing monitoring project for the last 10 years. You know, again, assessing where, 
where, uh, you know, where the flow is likely to go, where, if it's, where it's likely to erupt next. Um, and that's when we, that was in partnership with an engineering consultancy, and they were, they were in charge of, you know, big, of d designing and planning where you know, dikes were going to be drilled, you know, dug and to divert the flows away from populated areas. So again, a very, very important element. Geohazard detection and monitoring is a very, very important aspect of what we do. Seeps. So this is, a, this is offshore Ghana, this is at sea, uh, and what you're seeing here is an oil seep, what we call an oil seep. Uh, again, big, a big part of what we do, I mean, it's, if it's a seep, it's telling you that there's oil leaking from the seabed. So I, that, an oil company might be interested in that. Um, or is it a slick? Is it pollution? You know, has a well, you know, and, and that's a classic case. You know, quite often, uh, oil might wash up at uh, the country's beaches, and they go, where did this come from? Who's, who's to blame? And then they, they would employ us to look, analyze the satellite data and determine the, the source of that oil, oil slick, or if it even is an oil slick. So again, that's a very um, interesting, uh, interesting method. And then another element, and again, I could just go on and on of all the different kind of cool things that the satellite division does, is ice monitoring. So this, this literally is watching icebergs and pack ice breaking up and flowing, um, traveling. And what's, and anyone, I mean, anyone could do that, but what sets us apart is that we're able to take the image as soon as that data is captured and convert and interpret it and convert it to usable information within six hours of data capture. And that's really important, particularly in places like Newfoundland, anywhere there's busy shipping lanes or even drilling. You know, if, if you've got oil rigs kind of further north, they have to be aware of like, Arctic ice. Um, so it's a, huge, it's a huge business, and it's a hugely growing business. I mean, you'll all, you'll all be aware of like, um, Elon Musk, Tesla's plans to put thousands and thousands of satellites up. Everyone's putting satellites up. There's huge amounts of data available. And in MPA, uh, CGG, we're not just we're, we're converting all that and, and making it actionable, making it useful for people, and we're doing it real time, and we're using some of the latest techniques to do that, data science techniques. Um, so this is the last survey that was done of CGG. Um, it was in 2016, so it's a, few, it's a couple of years out of date. Um, in this case, it was asking all of our oil and gas, uh, uh, kind of not not just all of, all the different kind of companies in the oil and gas sector, from very small ones to the big ones like BP, was asking them to rate us and, and all the oil contractors. Um, and as you can see, we kind of came ahead of all of, by by very, by far of all the competition, um, and that's great. You know, we are we are the best. No no one is as good as us. However, it can also be a source of complacency. So, um, so it's also so we, at CGG again, we're very there's a very real focus on maintaining that of maintaining that edge. On that, on, in that, on that ambition, and, that, and I won't count, I haven't been recorded, <laughs> but corporate, corporate structures, they, they like producing lots of statements, values, ethics, mission statements, and sometimes you can just tune out completely. However, they do have their uses um, from time to time, and one of the things is like, these type of things, they, they remind you of what you're actually about. It's not just a day-to-day -day job, just sitting in front of a computer or whatever. It reminds you what the bigger picture is, and, and the key thing, the key takeaways from this is that we are all about, we're not, we don't compete on price, we're not about doing things as cheaply as possible to make as much money as possible, we're about doing things, the, being the best, doing things so when clients come to us, they, do it, they only have to do it once, they don't have to come back later. Um, so our competition really is ourselves, and internally, um, and, so, and that's why we are number one, and that's why we are, all of our, all of our clients identify us as number one in terms of innovation and excellence. So there's, another, there's also another part to this, and it's sustainability. It's something I'm asked about a lot. Um, as I say, I've, I am a technical guy, but I've been also comment to recruitment for a few months now. And a lot of students ask me about this, particularly with regards to oil and gas. And sustainability is a very, very important element of what we do, and there's a real focus on it. Um, so there's, uh, yeah, well, there's different ways of viewing sustainability. So obviously, we know, for instance, oil and gas, the future of oil and gas is a bit uncertain, and we're obviously aware of the challenges of global warming. Um, but the reality is, is that just like individuals can't change what they do, we can't change our lifestyle overnight uh, because we like, you know, computers, we like all the modern luxuries. We need the, the industrial kind of society we live in relies on oil and gas. A company is the same. A company like CGG, we have to change gradually. We make small steps. Um, so what we look at, we look at things in three ways. We look at things in what we can do today and what we can do in the future. Um, but you've got to make those changes, and, and ultimately, unless you, unless you want to bankrupt yourself, you've got to do them gradually. So one of the ways you look at doing things is we look to minimise our environmental impact, our direct environmental impact. So if we're doing, if we're going out and acquiring data, we're not, or we're whatever we're doing, we're not harming the environment we're in. 
So I've got an example here of a technology we developed called QuietSea, um, because obviously when you're acquiring um, seismic surveys at sea, you're emitting a very, very powerful source of, of sound waves into the ocean to record things from very, very deep down. And, if a marine, and it's never been tested, obviously, I must stress that, but if a marine mammal, like a whale, gets too close to that source, the expectation is it would probably hurt it very badly. So the industry, the oil industry has certain standards, um, including having the presence of marine mammal observers on board and, or, and pushing for kind of monitoring systems to try and pick up whale, whale song, for instance. But it's only CGG who've taken it um, to the full extent of actually incorporating whale detection technology into our actual seismic receivers. Uh, and the key thing there is that the kind of side, the bandwidth of, of sound waves we use for exploration ranges from about half a hertz to 200 hertz. And most whale song is in that same range. Um, so, I mean, I've shown an example of baleen whales here. They tend to be very low frequency. Um, so, if you, we, we're actually, so what we've done is that we've actually incorporated, as I say, um, an inversion, our inversion software and detection uh, scheme into our navigation and uh, receiver technology so that we can pick up whale song in real time and I've got a little diagram here of the software, locate the location and direction of that whale even if it's underwater. So we don't, you know, because a marine mammal observer sitting on the deck isn't going to be able to see a whale if it's underwater or if it's foggy or at night. So that's, uh, that's an element of where we've, at our cost, have gone and looked at improving it, reducing the environmental impact or mitigating potential problems um, on the environmental side. The other side we look at, so we minimize our environmental impact, we look to maximize our social impact. So obviously we work globally, so obviously we work with communities globally. So, um, so if, you know, when we work in Africa, we look at, um, we work with local universities, you know, we, we try and employ local people rather than bringing expats. But in the UK, what we do is we work with a charity called STEMnet. I don't know if any of you have heard of STEMnet, but it's a... Uh, it's effectively set up by the government many years ago, but it's effectively an independent charity which looks at bringing, running these fairs and other, other kind of uh, activities which brings uh, local companies in, in science and technology into schools, uh, showing kids what you can do with physics, maths, uh, engineer, you know, engineering. Um, and the idea is obviously that as time goes by, people only realize what you can, just all the cool things you can do. That it's, not, it's not a subject where you just sit and you work out you know, friction and balls rolling down ramps. There's a lot more to it. It encourages them to keep staying and do physics, you know, to A level, and then maybe go on to university to do physics or, or maths. So this is a very important part of what we do. We're, we're significant con contributors to this. We're recognised by the House of Lords as one of the top employers for this. Um, and actually, our employees volunteered 200 working days of their time last last year uh, in this in, in going into schools uh, as STEM ambassadors. And then the last element, uh, and these are kind of slightly crude images. Uh, I just Flung, flung in, uh, I must be, must be honest, because that's all I had available. What this is, is, is maintaining a technological edge. If, we, if you're a company and you want to survive, and this is just a rule anyway, in whatever industry, you need to be, keep, keep your, keep, you know, stay sharp, you need to be at the edge of developing new technologies. And obviously you will all be aware that the latest thing, and it has been ongoing for a few years now, is data science. You, know, you hear all the faddish terms, big data, machine learning, AI, but ultimately, um, whatever you call it, it's, it's using data, processing data much more efficiently and extracting a lot more value out of data than we have been previously. So uh, the examples I've got here, I would say, are quite simplistic. I, I, I must confess, I just whipped them in. But one of them is effectively noise detection, automating the noise detection flows. In the past, we had people going through, checking for noise, you know, and analyzing noise. But now we can automate it and we can speed the process up massively. Um, and the other thing, which is much more interesting, is, when I, is salt, salt body defining these salt bodies I talked about earlier. So in the past, it was very, very difficult to, to build them, to design them, because um, we had, you, when you interpreted them, you had to kind of work out where the top of it was, the bottom of it was, and if there was lots of flanks, how they all kind of work. You, know, you had to build up the body gradually over a period of six to seven months easily. Now, what we do is we, we train an algorithm effectively. We teach it what we're using to interpret top salt, for instance, or base salt, or whatever. And it does the work for us. And then what we do is we then QC the result. We check the result. We modify it. We give it a better training data set. It does a better job the next time. The whole process is accelerated massively. So this is something that we're, we're looking at in a big way uh, because we do process petabytes of data. I mean, it's more, it's, the common problem in data science is there's not enough data. For us, the problem is we have too much data. So um, again, there's been, so there's a big push internally. And, and we're providing training to people internally so that everyone, our geophysicists, and, so, and remote sensors become data scientists. Um, so it's quite an exciting time.
So I'm going to stop there for Q&A. Um, so, any questions? And I'll try and give some answers. Um, can you tell us about your recruitment process and the stages that are involved, please? Okay, yeah, so, so the recruitment process, so we effectively apply online on our website, usually. I mean, I think Gradcracker and other places where that list link uh, will take you, take you to it or take you to our, our job applications. Uh, and you just upload a covering letter and CV. So in the cover letter, you probably want to put something like, you, you would put, for instance, just a few sentences. You could put a lot more if you want, some people really go to town, but that's fine. Uh, but you might just say, you met me, for instance, here, or you heard me. If you're, if you're, if you're remote, you, you heard my, saw my presentation. Um, you were interested in, in what, what was, you were showing. Then you would just talk about yourself, what your motivation was for doing physics or, or whatever subject you do. Well, why did you do that? Why did you choose to do that subject? We're interested to know what motivated you to do it. And then lastly, again, we just want to maybe know a bit more about why you're interested in CDG. What particular aspect of it is, is intriguing you? Um, if you then want to talk about other stuff, you know, like some of the skills you've got from your hobbies and interests, that's also very valuable. Because sometimes a CV, CVs are great, but they're quite often just bullet points. Uh, cover letters are, are a bit of a cheat, a bit of an easy way of expanding on some of those bullet points and getting more information across too. And that's, just, that's a tip for any employer or any application, not just CGG. Once you've done that, there's then a video interview stage, which sounds a bit intimidating, but it's not. Um, what it is, it, it's, actually, it's a one-sided video interview. So you have a series of questions which are timed. You have a reading time and then you have talking time. Um, you'll be asked just the usual kind of questions. You know, what, why did, why, like, what do you know about CGG, for instance? You know, so it'd be interesting to see what research you've done. Um, you'll be asked things like, you know, what you think of strengths are. You know, things about internships. There'll also be a few problem-solving questions. So I recommend having a pen, paper, and calculator. However, I must emphasize that the, it's time-limited. So our expectations for the answers to the questions are not high. We're not wanting you to prove firm that's theorem. We're just wanting you to talk and tell us about yourself, ultimately. Um, and, and in terms of the problems, the, the, the time pressure is the hard bit, not the actual problem. So if you look at them logically, if you read them carefully, and you can draw them up. This is one of the things some people do. They draw them up, and they just show it on camera and go, yeah, this, is, this is my working out, you know, X plus blah, 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 or this is, a, this is the diagram of the problem you've just posed. And funny enough, that's, that's, that's perfect. So a lot of people get quite intimidated by video interviews, but actually they're quite useful. They're not a substitute for a face-to-face, -face, they're a substitute for a telephone interview. And the reason why we do video interviews is because we recruit globally. We don't just recruit in the UK for our positions. So it's very difficult to schedule telephone interviews with people in Russia or China or Colombia. Um, but the other benefit of it for you as well is that you can do it when it suits you. We give you a week to do it. So you can leave it to midnight if you want. You can do it when it absolutely suits you. You've got, you've got a full belly or you've not got a full belly. You've, got, you've just been for a run. You, you feel your head's clear. You know, you, you know, whatever. When you're almost relaxed um, or when you're almost ready, you can do it when you, when you want. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, and then in terms of video interviews, in terms of general advice, as I say, remember just expectations, but structure your questions. So if you're asked a question about, I don't know, your project or your final project or whatever, just think, right, okay, you've only got a time limit. Get your message across quickly. So say what the aim of your project was. If your project's completed, give the conclusion immediately. Say, this was the aim of my project. This is my conclusion. This is, I, I was successful. If your project's not completed, say, say what the measure of success is going to be. I will know I am successful if, you know, you know I slow light down by 50% or whatever, you know, whatever your measure of success is. Then talk it in methodology. There's so many people just launch into it and you never get to the conclusion because they spend so long on the methodology. And the same if you're talking about, if you're asked to talk about your strengths, give it, this is actually, to be honest, this is just general interview advice now, really. Talk about, you can say, yeah, I'm a great team worker, but don't stop there. Give a specific example, always give a specific example. Because lots of people say, oh yeah, I'm really analytical. Great, it's, you know, okay, I'm waiting. So that, that, the key thing is general, give a general answer and then talk about specifics. Um, and it's, you can even have a crib sheet, you know, just a few headers, just reminding yourself, you know, this is the example when I, was a, when I was working in a restaurant, you know, customer service example, this is a teamwork example. You don't have to memorize it all. But you'll probably find it, come, and you might actually find that you don't even have to refer to it because it gives you that confidence. So, yeah, just, just general, general tips there. Then once you've done the video interview, so the video interview is actually probably the, I would say the hardest element of it in terms of kind of like, uh, it's then the, the kind of more classic, it's the assessment day. 
But the, the difference between us and maybe other employers is that they're not big. They're usually like, the most people that come is maybe 10, 10 people, but usually they're about five or six people. Because if you've got to that stage, you're going to be, if all of you do well, you'll all be hired. It's not a competition. And in fact, a lot of the things we test you on are about cooperation and teamwork and communication. So it's, 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 yeah, and if we see kind of competitive behavior, if we see someone trying to dominate the others, that's, that's a, a negative. You know, we, we, don't, we don't like that kind of arrogance because ultimately it's not, we, you know, I don't think there's any, I mean, I know that, for instance, like banks have maybe somebody have a reputation, but I don't think there's any employer who wants people who are arrogant, who, are push, you know, who push themselves above other people. Teamwork is, is ultimately what it's all about because you've got to, you, you, don't join a, you don't join a project for a week or two weeks. You're on these projects for potentially years. You're working with this team for years. To be honest, you spend more time with your, your fellow, your colleagues than you would your family sometimes. So, you know, te you know that teamwork, team spirit, getting able to get, communicate with people, get on with people. And the other thing as well is that the fear of failure is something as well. I mean, as again, just general advice, Communic honest communication, if you make a mistake, everyone makes mistakes. It's when people kind of don't admit to mistakes or, or are afraid to tell people they made mistakes. That's where there's problems. So again, communication is an important thing that we assess. And the other part of the assessment centre then is also um, there is a technical element where what we do is we send you a couple of papers beforehand, and you, you know, and we and we say we, we say we may ask you some questions about the papers. So uh, I, I emphasise that you should probably, if you do get sent those papers, you should read those papers um, because we will ask you some questions about those papers. Um, but again, if you do your research, and we do tend to find that physicists do very well because they do their research, they look at the problem, they don't look at the geophysics problem or geology problem, they look at it as a physics physics problem, they break it down, they tend, to do it, they tend to do very well in the technical interview because they do their research, they take the problem seriously. So, yeah, and then that's it, usually we let you know either the next day or in a couple of days if you've been successful. And I guess the last thing to add as well on that regard is that we'll expect you to pay for your expenses to get there and, for the, and if you need accommodation overnight to pay for that, but we will arrange accommodation and we will reimburse you afterwards. Um, so it's just something else to be aware of. Thanks. Is there a chance to travel when yes, you work so for Yes, so obviously we're, we're a global company. Um, so interestingly enough, a lot of people don't choose to travel actually because the, our main office in the UK is near Gatwick Airport. And because we recruit globally for the office, it's actually incredibly diverse. So about 50%, it's probably less than 50% of the office is actually of British origin. So a lot, you know, for instance, my old team uh, that I was managing for on the secondment, I mean, it was Russian, Chinese, Italian, Polish, um, there was an Iranian, you know, there was a whole mix of different nationalities. Um, so it's a very, very, very diverse uh, environment you're in. And as I say, uh, and, and then kind of on top of that as well is, you know, so I think, there's, I think, yeah, I think we reckon there was like 40 different nationalities. So actually a lot of people don't choose to leave. And of course you've got London very close by as well. So you don't really live, some, sometimes you kind of feel like you don't really live in Britain, you live in some kind of like international bubble anyway. Um, but if you do want to travel, you just simply you make it known that you do. And then what will happen is, is that obviously you, you gain a bit of experience in the UK, you kind of get trained up, and then as a business seed arises or an opportunity arises, you can apply to travel. So I had a friend who, he'd, he'd done a couple of years in, in the UK, and it was like, well, I really want to uh, go to Rio de Janeiro. Very popular office, everyone's going to Rio de Janeiro for some reason. Um, and he did, even though he's working there now, and it's usually a two-year secondment, you know, that they, people go on, then they come back to the UK, and then maybe an opportunity might arise in Perth, Australia, or somewhere else. So, yeah, it's a global company, so there's, there are opportunities to travel. So I guess, I guess the last thing, and if no one else has got any questions, that I would emphasize is, well, <laughs> emphasize a few things. First of all, we're completely transparent about our salaries, so um, you can find out on our website, but I can tell you now that, for instance, for the geophysicist position, it's uh, 32,000 pounds per year for a master's. For the remote sensing position, which, which will recruit BSEs, uh, it starts at 27,000 pounds per year. We provide a company accommodation for the first nine months, so you don't need to find somewhere to live immediately. So you could, you could and, there it's, and to be honest, it's a bit like university, because you get put in with the other graduates that just started. So the key differences are that when you finish work and go home, there's no little voice telling you you should be working or on some problem or doing your homework or thinking about some exam, because it's over, the day's over. You know, those problems for the next day and you have money. And in the case of the Gatwick office, you're right next to Gatwick Airport and cheap flights pretty much anywhere in the world if you fancy it. So it's a really good vibe actually. I really enjoyed it myself when I had the company housing about 12 years ago and um, 
yeah, I'd recommend it to anyone. So that's something to consider. And that has, there's two sides to that. I mean, one, on the kind of more negative side, I would say, is that if you do join us and, for, and you, after a few months you decide actually it's not the role you thought it was or it's not the job you, job you thought it was, then you've got, you haven't had to go through the credit check process, sign up for a six-month or 12-month tenancy, all of that hassle. You just say, actually, uh, thanks for the opportunity, I'd like to go. And that's it. You just go. So there's, you know, um, so yeah, so, so, there's, so there's a whole range of benefits. And, then, and there's other, other things like, you know, pri there's a lot of things that other companies offer as well. You know, flexible working, there are no core hours. You just work. Obviously, if a client comes in, you need to be there. If you've got a very hard deadline, obviously, people work for it. But in general, there are no core hours. So you can come in early, leave early, work more one day, work less another. Uh, you're adults, basically. You're responsible for yourself. You know, you don't, you don't, need, you don't need some strict schedule telling you, you know, you've, been, you've had that at school. You don't need that anymore. And then in terms of dress code, I mean, I've dressed myself up because I knew I was going to be on video. But to be honest, um, I couldn't bear, myself, couldn't bear to put a proper set of shoes on. And, most, you know, and then you, if, unless, again, if less clients are in, um, you can wear what you like. There's no dress policy, except barring no swimwear. That, that is, there is that dress policy. Um, unwritten rule, no swimwear. But otherwise, there's no dress policy. So people come in shorts, sandals, you know, whatever. You know, so it's, yeah, it's, 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 about, it's about your adults. It's a, serious, it's a serious job, a very, very challenging industry. Um, and you'll be doing physics um, day to day. It's, it's, not, um, it's a business, a uh, commercial venture. You know, it's about making money. Um, but that you are adults, so you'll be treated like adults. Yeah.